Welcome to the second part of our discussion of hesychism. Here we're going to look at those early hesychistic leaders, St. John of the Latter and St. Maximus the Confessor. So what do you think of when you hear theosis? It's all right, we can wait a minute. What are your thoughts when you hear this word, this term? Probably a good number of you still got nothing. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I I don't know. I'm not familiar with this term. Or, or like, I don't know, I've tried teasing out words before and sometimes that's worked. Maybe is it something to do with like osmosis, but somehow different? Again, if that's where you're thinking and that's where you're moving, I have got to applaud you for giving it a shot. I mean, the answer is no, but you're giving it a shot. Others of you might think, okay, we're talking about hesychism. This is our second time talking about it and it's something to do with ascetical mysticism as this is the practice. So I don't know, some churchy th stuff. And then I have to say, good job. You're, you're there somewhat. I mean, you're in the right ballpark because you knew from the drive where we were going. But theosis becomes one of those goals, a deeper goal to notions of hesychism. It's not just to have a dispassionate life or to be impassable, as was being addressed last time, but it's actually to arrive at a certain goal. And, and that's really what these earlier advocates of hesychism were pushing for. And this is where we will get to. It'll be just a moment, but we're on our way. While the undisputed champion of hesychism in the 14th century was Gregory of Palamas, we do have many of the ideas and techniques used by Gregory well before his time, going back to the third century with St. Anthony the Great, in fact, possibly even earlier examples than those used by St. Anthony. And we'll see hesychism emerging and continuing well through the to today. We have 20th century examples of St. Joseph the Hesychist. Uh, right? And this is a practice and a technique that isn't just fixed in one time or one location, but kind of exists as a ascetical, mystical practice within all of Eastern Christianity, pretty much from the beginning till today. Some of the more prominent early advocates of hesychism, especially when addressing the notion of the passions, are St. Maximus the Confessor and St. John of the Latter. Really, their practices and the practices that exist and kind of emerge from the 4th to the 7th century really emphasizes how we are to overcome the passions. And these two men, while contemporaries, really kind of give us a breadth of understanding. In fact, it's remarkable what happened in their lives. Both were likely born in Constantinople, living shortly after the zenith of the Roman Empire. Justinian's reign ended in 565, and they're both born uh, within 15 years of that. But by the time of their death in the seventh centuries, we see the loss of three of the seats of Christianity, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Both will become monastics in North Africa, or, or very close, technically Sinai is not North Africa, but pretty dang close. Uh, and they have their relations to one another then, both of which are monks, both of which are known for their writings and their holiness and the challenges that they faced. Maximus is brought all around a little bit more and maybe a little more profile during his life. But St. John's writings have massive impact still to this day within Orthodox Christianity. Born in 580 in Constantinople and dying in 662 in prison, thus the name the Confessor, Maximus was born of noble parents and received the best education in the world. In his 30s, he was even the secretary to the emperor. 
and would later renounce this and become a monk to live in quiet prayer, although his life was anything but quiet as he was involved in controversies of his day. He will move to North Africa to practice monasticism with St. Sophronos. And when St. Sophronos becomes elected the Patriarch of Jerusalem, he will move there around 634 and continue to engage in different discussions and trying to just become a quiet monk. He'll return back to Carthage and try to find refuge from the Arab invasions, which were threatening Christians in North Africa. And yet throughout all of this chaos, Maximus is often identified as a cosmic theologian because he sees the unfolding of the world as the unfolding of God through the incarnation. He identifies the divine logos and in the incarnation as the central ideas to which all of nature resounds and resonates. He says that the Bible and nature tell the same story, that of the eschatological epiphany where the cosmos is transfigured through God's becoming, through the incarnation. And through the incarnation, the logoi, those principles behind the created cosmos, and the telos, the direction, the aim of creation are opened up. This is then expressed in our own lives, in our own births. He says our first, that being, our coming into being, then our second birth in baptism, and ultimately in our own resurrection. Maximus developed this in large measure to confront the heresy of origin or originism. Origin and his system were condemned on numerous occasions and his theology was powerful and persuasive in many people's minds. He was a great philosopher, but a bad theologian, or at least a lot of his followers took ideas too far. As a quick side, it's really difficult addressing Origen to say what exactly is Origen's writings and which of these were just a school of thought to which his name was attached that oftentimes would have gone probably farther than Origen would have been comfortable with himself. But with that aside mentioned, Origenism held the notion of a pre-existence of the soul that there was a pre-eternity to which we all belonged. And this is borrowing a lot from Platonism uh, and really predates other sort of philosophical notions of Neoplatonism by quite a long time, but has a lot of familiarity with it. But according to Originism, rational beings exist in a state of pure rest, contemplating God. But over time, they fell away from God, and this fall is why we have physical bodies. God created the world so these fallen souls would have the opportunity to be redeemed. And again, this is very Neoplatonic, but well before the time of the Neoplatonists. The general movement for Origen was beginning with rest in God, pre-eternal, a movement away from God, and this was the act of becoming. Maximus says that this doesn't work since God is beautiful and true movement from God after resting in God wouldn't make sense. And also, why would this cause creation or becoming? Furthermore, if we once fell away from God after growing weary of the divine presence, why would this not happen over and over and over again? This is very problematic for Origen, since he also held notions of universal salvation. Rather, the opposite was advocated by Maximus, that we start off with notions of becoming, that God creates us, that we have a movement towards God, and the goal is rest in God. And that this is the telos, this is the aim, this is the direction of all of us. Maximus holds that it's also ridiculous to believe that souls existed before and apart from bodies, as they are necessary components of man uh, and we are used one for another. The goal for Maximus is the notion of theosis, or rest in God. 
Ultimate rest in God allows for the Christian to partake of God's love through God's energies and becomes like God in the process. This is the goal for all Hesychists, and indeed, in many ways, the goal for all people. Both the soul and body are created for ultimate deification and partaking of the glory of God. In fact, you read this in Psalm 82.6, you are God's and all of you are children of the Most High. But theosis is the understanding that human beings can have union with God and become like God to such a degree that we participate in the divine nature. Participate, but don't possess. There is a difference there, right? It's also referred to as deification or divinization or illumination. Father David Hester identifies theosis as the gradual process by which a person is renewed and unified so completely with God that he becomes by grace what God is by nature. Again, not God's where you have this innate ability, but taking on this. And others will liken it to the example of iron in the fire. The iron never becomes fire, but it participates so fully in the fire's energies that it partakes in the fire. It has heat, it glows, it may even have fluidity, which is contrary to the nature of the iron and belongs to the nature of the fire. There's a lot of things that theosis is not, and a lot of people will mistake theosis with other ideas. So it's important to note that theosis is not the merging uh, with some sort of impersonal divine force, right? Where you're at the drop in the sea and you disappear, or the loss of the individual identity or consciousness. It's also not intrinsic divinity. You don't become gods. Uh, and therefore have the power of God. You're not confusing either the creation with the being of God. Most certainly humans are not accorded any sort of ontological equality with God, nor are they considered to merge or commingle with the being of God as God is in God's essence, nor is it becoming your own God of your own planet as others in the 19th century might advocate. Now, theosis is this rest in God. It's this union with God. It's being holy like God is holy, though God is still God and you're still not. Another advocate of this idea and of hesychism in general is a man by the name of St. John of the Ladder. There's almost no information about his origins or his beginning of his life. Sometime around the age of 16, he'll go off to St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai and become a monk. St. Catherine's Monastery is at the base of the mountain where Moses received the Ten Commandments and is really one of, if not the oldest continuous monastery in the world. Um, the reason why even surrounded by forces of Islam, you're going to have this Christian center of monasticism is because it also contains the only handwriting left from Muhammad that Muhammad said, don't touch this place and gave it his seal of protection as much as anything else. So while Islam will surround the Sinai Peninsula, St. Catherine's Monastery is going to be immune from any sort of interference. St. John will learn from his monastic leader until he dies and then goes and spends a bunch of his time kind of in the wilderness outside of the monastery by himself. Being drawn back, he's named the next abbot, the next person in charge of the monastery and will govern for those last four years of his life. It is here that he was requested to write a guide for those entering monastic life. And while he felt unworthy of this task, he submitted and wrote the work that we get his name from, uh, the Ladder of Divine Ascent. This is why he's called St. John of the Ladder. The Ladder of Divine Ascent 
was written at the request of another abbot who wanted him to write down whatever was necessary for salvation for monks. St. John relented and, and wrote this work. And so anyone who was a monk would be able to learn of the struggles to achieve union with God, to achieve theosis. And while the audience is definitely monastics, this has become a standard book read by Orthodox Christians over Lent for the next 1500 or so years. Now, not everyone reads it, but it's there because it's got practical purposes in helping you overcome the passions, the challenges that you face in your life. It serves as a basic ethical treatise for those who want to advance in their life and overcome those passions. It consists of 30 steps or rungs leading to spiritual perfection. Step one is the complete renunciation of the world, which is a logical step if you're a monk and a little bit harder if you're not. Step 30 is love. Ultimately, this is the goal. It is also one of the first books to be printed with the printing press, as it was a popular devotional work, not only for monks, but for the laity as well. There's usually an icon associated with this work, um, and it will show monks and priests ascending the ladder to God. They are also getting pulled down by demons through the aids of the passions and yet are encouraged also by heavenly hosts trying to say, you can do it, you can make it, ascend the heights, right? There's this large path being done. So let us spend a little bit of time on a few of these steps to understand this process. We won't start on the first step since most of you aren't going to become monks and that isn't the aim and the goal here. Uh, but looking at these practical issues that can help you in your own life. Step eight is on freedom from anger and on meekness. He states as the gradual pouring of water on a fire completely extinguishes the flame. So the tears of true mourning are able to quench every flame of anger and irritability. Freedom from anger is therefore victory over nature and insensibility to insults acquired by struggles and sweat. Meekness is an immovable state of the soul, which remains unaffected, whether in evil report or in good report, in dishonor or in praise. So brings us to a very simple question. Can you be angry and humble at the same time? Can you be meek and hold anger towards others? Can you be personally angry at being wronged? Maybe there's room for the wrongs done to another and being humble. But broadly speaking, the answer is no, not really. But freedom of anger begins with being meek with looking at yourself and being humble. And therefore, when others do wrong, you're not going to lash out against them. Continuing in four, he says, the beginning of freedom from anger is silence of the lips. When the heart is agitated in the middle is silence of the thoughts when there is mere disturbance of the soul and the end becomes an imperturbable calm under the breath of unclean winds. Like we've heard before many of us over and over again, when you're angry, count to three before responding. And this is something that's being advocated here by St. John. Stop, reflect, take a breath. Be silent. Don't speak so fast when your heart is agitated. The first step in being free from anger is not to react to it immediately, to try to slow down your process, which is easier said than done. 
and only is going to happen through patience and practice, then we can silence the thoughts that disturb us. And finally, you will be calm. St. John also points out what anger actually is. And this is a concept that's a little hard to get, and a little frustrating for many of us, maybe too. St. John says, anger is a reminder of hidden hatred, which sounds a little harsh, right? Anger is a reminder of a hidden hatred. That is to say, a remembrance of wrongs. Anger is a desire for the injury of the one who has provoked you. When you're angry, there's some sort of hidden hatred. You have wronged me. Therefore, there's a problem that needs to be dealt with. I'm frustrated with you. I hate that I can't do what I want and you become that object. Again, this is rather difficult for us to accept, but it's really hard to reject too. That idea that anger is a reminder of some sort of hidden hatred when you're angry, is it because you're remembering the wrongs that others have committed against you? You're not loving when you're angry. You're not forgiving. And if you stop and look at your own life, who are you the most angry with? More often than not, it's not the stranger. It's those that you love. Any of you have any brothers or sisters? Do you love them? Why is it that they're usually the ones that make you the most angry? I mean, their actions definitely have a role, but they also know exactly where to push those buttons, don't they? They know exactly where your weaknesses are. They know exactly where you don't feel comfortable. They serve as a mirror to your own faults. They show you where you're not good. And that's problematic. Maybe the hidden hatred isn't at them, but at your own faults. Are you always angry with them or is some of the time that you're just angry with yourself? that you didn't want to reflect on your faults, but they're showing it to you. Maybe not in a very kind way. Uh, maybe they're, they're making sure you notice it, but maybe that's what they're doing. Are you angry with them because they demonstrate your misplaced affections and things and objects? Because they show you how selfish you can be, or are they just maybe unlovable jerks? Maybe it's just them. St. John continues, though we know very many intolerable fruits of anger, we have found only one, its involuntary offspring, which though illegitimate is nevertheless useful. Right, what is the outcome here? What is the value that can come out of this problem? He says he has seen people flaring up madly and vomiting their long stored malice, who by their very passion were delivered from passion, and who have obtained from their offender either penance or an explanation of the long standing grievance. I've seen others who have seemed to show a brute patience, but who are nourishing resentment within them under the cover of silence. Right? Is it so possible indeed to be angry with someone that you confront them and you rid your anger of that issue forever? Many of us have different stories in our life where we're so angry with somebody and we blow up at them and then it goes away. We're done. No reason to be angry anymore. He continues and addresses the issues of anger and sensuality. 
Now, sometimes we're angry not just because somebody is a mirror, but because of a disposition that needs to be worked on. He says, when for some reason I was sitting outside a monastery near the cells of those living in solitude, I heard them fighting by themselves in their cells, like caged par uh, partridges from bitterness and anger, and leaping at the face of their offenders as if they were actually present. Have you ever yelled and freaked out at somebody who isn't there? Your anger with them just seethes in you as you flail out, thinking about something or recollecting something, or that you're acting crazed. And he said he, as the one in charge, as the abbot, devoutly advised them not to stay in solitude in case they should be changed from human beings into demons. Right? Sometimes if you can't sit and be good in your own self, if you're always thinking of disasters and, and those who have wronged you, then maybe you need a distraction. Maybe you need to be around others. Maybe you need some encouragement from other people. It says that he has also observed people who are sensual and corrupt in heart and are sometimes meek, what you might call flatterers, familiar, fond of outward show. And I advise these to go and adopt a life of solitary, using this as a cure for sensuality and corruption of heart lest from rational beings they should be pitifully changed into irrational animals. Irrational animals is a little bit better than being turned into demons, but both of which you've lost your humanity. But when some of them told me that they were wretched victims of these two passions, anger and sensuality, I absolutely forbade them to live according to their own will. But in a friendly way, I suggested to their superiors that they should allow them sometimes to live in one way, sometimes to live in another way, but that they should be entirely subject to the superior. You know this, and we've encountered this idea before that different people are struck differently and, and need different solutions to their problems. Some people are angry and need somebody there to cool them off. That they need to remember that they need other people. Others, though, their main faults are being sensual. They're, they're flatterers. They want everyone to be paying attention to them. There's issues of, of pride in both of these. You're angry because your pride has been hurt. Your pride makes you want the love and attention from everybody instead of being comfortable by yourself. So what do you do? The solution, according to St. John, is that you need a guide. You need somebody to help you along the way, a mentor, a spiritual father, a spiritual mother, somebody who's not just a friend, although friends could be helpful, but somebody will say, here's how you should live. And they know you enough and you respect them enough that you can learn from that. There's this key idea to our morality that we need to be treated as individuals, that there's not a one size fits all problem. And yet, how do you know? Because usually if we're left to our own devices, we'll probably go the easiest way and will either be turned into demons or irrational beasts, neither of which is what we're wanting out of our life. Climacus tells us that if we are observant, we shall see many irritable people are practicing vigils, fasts, and silence. Right? That there's a lot of people who have their passions inflamed while doing pious activities. It says, for the aim of the demons is to suggest to them, under the pretext of penance and mourning, just what is likely to increase their passion. Sometimes you're doing an act that outwardly is a good thing, and you know that this is the way to fake it till you make it, but maybe sometimes you're there and you're judging those around you or you're 
growing even more irritable and angry and sensual with the very moment. You're fasting and all you can think about is food. You're at a vigil and all you're thinking about is yourself. Climacus also asks us to do something that is really outside of where most of us would be feel comfortable with. And our society doesn't really encourage this sort of idea too much. And that's accepting dishonor. He says the beginning of blessed patience is to accept dishonor with sorrow and bitterness of the soul. That you're going to be patient. You're going to have to take what others are launching against you, even if it's not okay. So the middle stage is therefore to be free from pain in the midst of these things. And perfection, if possible, is to regard dishonor as praise. Let the first rejoice, let the second be strong, let the third uh, is blessed, for he exults in the Lord. And we can think of those who have fought righteous fights, who accepted dishonor and didn't lash back and didn't attack even though they were justified to do so. And usually for those people who exalted, who regarded dishonor as praise, said, you know what, you're attacking me because I'm right, because this cause is righteous and you don't like that. We view these people as great, not easy, but as heroes for a cause. He then continues and says, I once saw three monks receive the same injury at the same time. One felt the sting of this, but kept silent. The second rejoiced at his injury for his reward it would bring him, but was sorry for the wrongdoer. And the third, thinking of the harm his erring neighbor was suffering, wept fervently. And fear, reward, and love were to be seen at work. We have three different ways that we could accept dishonor. We can just keep quiet but burn in anger. Or we could feel sad for that person who's making us the laughing stock, making us the dishonorable one, making us seem like we're somehow in the wrong, but you're not. I mean, I'm thinking a lot of this in my mind of, you know, civil rights movement and and those peaceful protests of sit-ins, right? I'm going to sit here and you're going to launch attacks at me and I'm not going to fight back. I feel sorry for you that you're so close-minded and, and want to hate just based on skin or, or anything else. You can be angry. There's There's good cause to be angry, but looking upon them with pity, or even more so the whole idea of weeping for the sins of others, for them being selfish, right? that this is the best option according to Climacus, to actually feel sorry for their mistakes, and not with the self-righteous sort of way of, well, you know, if you were as good as me, uh, but having this actual, true, deep down sorrow that their sins are limiting their life, that their anger, their misplaced aggression towards you is, is making their life less beneficial. We can ask ourselves, what's better to be silent or weep for others? And why? Some of us might think we're going to end up only being a punching bag for others. Or would you just end up not worrying about it? I mean, these could be really your two possible outcomes of accepting dishonor in this way. Maybe you can realize that they already have their punishment, right? Justice has been served and you have to be you. That's worse than anything I could say or do to you. I'm not going to not worry about it. I'm going to feel sorry for you because you have to be you. And again, that is a judgment. That is something that changes how we would look at things. What would you gain from accepting this perspective? And how would this change how we would treat other people overall? What's the moral standard that we would be expecting to live up to? 
this is clearly beyond what Kant would advocate or or anybody else because this is over and above but at the same time we can see where it's rooted and where it's coming from and, and that there's a larger perspective at work here and maybe even one that helps us move forward with our lives on step nine he moves forward and addresses the remembrance of wrongs he asks us why do we remember the wrongs that others have committed against us what benefit does that actually serve for us what do you actually gain when you remember when others have hurt you possibly you know that you're, you're going to avoid getting hurt in the same way but that's not the same thing as remembrance of wrongs it's not okay yeah you're not a trustworthy person or you like to hurt me and i should move away from you right that's that's not the same thing when we're thinking about remembrance of wrongs we're thinking of festering over what others have done against you what does Climacus identify as the remembrance of wrongs he says it's the consummation of anger the keeper of sins hatred of righteousness ruin of virtues poison of the soul worm of the mind shame of prayer stopping of supplication the estrangement of love a nail stuck in the soul pleasureless feeling beloved in the sweetness of bitterness continuous sin unsleeping transgression and an hourly malice none of these are very positive we don't have a lot that we can take from this remembrance of wrongs in fact he says this dark and hateful passion i mean remembrance of wrongs is one of those that are produced but not have no offspring what does he mean by this there's no benefit that comes out of it no possible turn that you can get by remembering the wrongs that others have done to you or to even other people at anger you might eventually blow up and then realize okay this was a, a small and insignificant thing that i overworked in my own mind or i've overstepped and, and now we can both apologize to the, each other but with remembrance of wrongs it's just yourself it's just things eating you it's not like there's a good that can come from it like even some of the other passions it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die it's not productive it only in fact is going to harm you he says he who has obtained love has banished revenge but he who nurses enmities stores up for himself endless sufferings you're the only person who suffers by remembering the wrongs the person who caused the wrongs the person who's causing you this distress doesn't affect them at all but it does affect you so remove this passion from your life is what Climacus is urging his fellow monks to do he says the remembrance of wrongs is an interpreter of scripture of the kind that adjusts the words of the spirit to its own views let it be put to shame by the prayer of Jesus right that Jesus prayer Lord Jesus Christ son of God have mercy on me a sinner which cannot be said with it it's again very hard to remember the sins of other ones when you're asking for mercy for yourself you cannot have remembrance of wrongs and say the Jesus prayer at the same time you cannot genuinely hold a grudge and ask for mercy otherwise you're not actually asking for mercy you're asking you know hey forgive me I'm doing great that guy over there let's get him right that, that, that's not the attitude of mercy and that's what you're trying to foster with this rational love this this love of the Spirit of God this is the overcoming of the passions this is the the basis of this ethical system and once again he says you will know that you have completely got rid of this rot not when you pray for the person who has offended you nor when you exchange presents with him nor when you invite him to your table but only when on hearing that he has fallen into spiritual or bodily misfortune 
that you suffer and weep for him as you would for yourself. Right? That is when you no longer remember the wrongs, when you actually decide to love this person. And there's a lot of steps for most of us along this way. Right? The, okay, I'll pray for you. I don't really like you, but I'll pray for you. Or, all right, let me at least give you something. I'll, I'll have an outward show that you and I are at peace. Or I'll even invite you over. And maybe I'll learn to tolerate your presence instead of just seething with hatred. The real step, the goal of all of this is, again, this beloved community. When you hear that they'll even fall and you won't just have this little glint of like, oh yeah, finally came to them, good job. But you'll weep over that instead. Step 18, Climacus moves on to the issue of insensibility. Unlike other philosophies that try to help you to overcome the passion, such as Buddhist notions of naroda or complete detachment, getting rid of all attachments to anybody and anything, once cravings, clingings, etc. Hesychism has the opposite push. Climacus points out that we need to be hypersensible, not insensible. We have to decide if we want to weep for the sins of our enemies or ignore them. We can't sit on the fence with this one. It's not okay or comfortable. We can't be partially sensitive to these issues. Otherwise, it'll only result in our own pain and our own damnation. So which one? Complete detachment or increased sensitivity? Which one is the one really that you should do? This is a very clear difference between Christian hesychism and Buddhist notions on what we should be striving for to overcome our passions. Climacus doesn't really leave a lot of room for doubt. He says that insensibility, both in the body and in the spirit, is a deadening feeling, which from long sickness and negligence lapses into loss of feeling. That insensibility is negligence that has become habit Right? There's a power of habit that Aristotle and others talk about, that there's advantage of building good habits, but insensibility, according to Climacus, is negligence that grows into a habit. It's a negative habit. It, it's going to cause you ruin instead of flourishing. Furthermore, he says, he who has lost sensibility is a brainless philosopher, a self-condemned commentator a self-contradictory windbag, a blind man who teaches others to see. His mouth prays against his passion and his body struggles for it. He philosophizes about death, but he behaves as if he was immortal. All the time he is his own accuser, and he does not want to come to his senses. I will not say he cannot, but that if you've become insensitive, Climacus says that you don't really want to come to your senses. He says you can, it's in your ability, but you have desired that you don't do this. Finally, he concludes, as far as my poor powers of knowledge allow, I have exposed the wiles and wheels of this stony, obstinate, raging, and stupid passion. Right, that you need to grow your sensibilities and your sensitivities to others, that this is the way to love. And love means caring about those, even when it is gonna harm you. So if the passions are those things that drag us down and bring us to ruin, as at least is being indicated here by Climacus, what good are the passions? Why would we have them be a part of our human nature? I mean, really, why? Later, we saw that Palamas hints at at least some benefit that could come from the passions themselves. The energy that we use in our passions could be used instead for something positive and something good, something that would make our lives better. And it's really to this idea 
that Maximus turns his attention. So returning once again to Maximus the Confessor, we're going to see his discussion on the utility of the passions. He asks the same question we just asked. Are the passions evil in themselves or do they become so when they are used in an evil way? He says he's speaking here of pleasure, grief, desire, fear, and the rest. Now notice here that Maximus's view of what the passions are, are kind of a step back from what Climacus was addressing. Climacus was talking about those evil results while Maximus is talking about the broader impulse and where it might go. How should we look at things like pleasure, grief, desire, fear, and the rest? How do we see them? Are these things negative? Or could there be positives with them as well? They've been viewed as having the potential to do good, but also to do evil. Like Descartes and others, it's, it's about fuel. It's really about what you're doing with that fuel. Right? Nuclear power can be one of the most clean sources of energy we have. It's the only source of energy where the waste is managed. Now, again, the waste is bad waste, but it's manageable. You can put it somewhere. You can do something with it. But nuclear power can also be explosive, and the waste can be catastrophic. Right? Same water that boils an egg, making it hard can soften a potato. Is it something inherent in hot boiling water? Or is it about that object that is sitting in that boiling water? Maximus says that these passions and the rest as well were not originally created together with human nature. For if they had been, he said, they would contribute to the definition of what it meant to be a human. Right? The passions, he says, were introduced and attached themselves to the more irrational part of our human nature. That not all of our human nature is rational, and therefore the passions can attach themselves to this and then cause issues. Moreover, he says, the passions can become good in those who are spiritually earnest once they have wisely separated them from corporeal objects and use them to gain possession of heavenly things. Maximus is a bit more of a philosopher's philosopher, and he's really trying to understand the idea of the will and how it attaches to itself, the idea of what it is to be man. This is really important for Maximus because of a basic patristic teaching that that which Christ does not assume, he does not save. In other words, if Christ didn't have the passions, are we saved from the passions? And what would that mean? Maximus says that Christ submitted to him those passions of fallen humanity, so that by experiencing our temptations, he might provoke the evil power and thwart its attack, putting to death the very power that expected to seduce him. For it is by this bond that man's will inclines towards wicked pleasures against his own best interest, and that man declares in the very silence of his works his enslavement being unable in his fear of death to free himself from his slavery to pleasure. Are we indeed slaves to pleasure? Is the idea of pleasure so strong that it controls you? I mean, this is an idea that was argued by Diogenes, as we've addressed before. Get away from me, you tyrant. You pleasure that's not worth seeking, that's hard and, and too much work and, and not something that's desirable. Many of us reject the idea of cynicism because it doesn't value pleasure in the same way that we do. But are you just a subject, a slave to this idea of pleasure? I mean, this is the appeal of hedonism, isn't it? That you want a life of pleasure, that pleasure is good, even if it's sometimes unreasonable, as the Stoics would argue. And sometimes we'd even add unvirtuous, as Aristotle would point out. 
But our, our classic Greek systems really address this idea of pleasure and its place in controlling the passions or controlling us and leading us into these passions. For Maximus, the question starts off with Christ and did Christ submit himself to these passions as well? And the answer is yes, but not falling into them, not succumbing to them, but having them there as temptations, experiencing our temptations and thwarting the attack and the power of evil. That this is the value of it and therefore you have a possible notion of redemption. But what do you do when you choose pleasures that are against your own best interest? And why do you do so? Maximus is probably not as kind as you might want to be with it. He says, man's will out of cowardice tends away from suffering. And man against his own will remains utterly dominated by the fear of death. And its desire to live clings to his slavery to pleasure. Again, are you a slave to pleasure? Does it control and dominate every one of your waking decisions? And maybe even overnight. How is this slavery, like what Julian the Apostate was addressing, potentially owning you, like property, money, birth, strength, beauty, etc.? Are you free if all you look for in life is pleasure? How is this desire for property, money, birth, strength, beauty, etc., different than a desire for pleasure? You might say that these are all there to gain pleasure, but then that just makes that the master slave owner that you are now subservient to. If indeed, as Julian argued, that we need freedom to enjoy these things, could the same be said about pleasure? And where would we say that this pleasure comes from? In many ways, this is not a rhetorical question. You need to decide what pleasures are valuable for you. Is the pursuit of pleasure itself a good, as hedonism advocates, something to be avoided, as cynicism advocates, only if it's a rational pleasure, as the Stoics would advocate, or is it something different? Because this will change how you approach the passions in your life and what you're going to do with those moving forward. And if indeed we want freedom to have pleasure when we want it instead of when pleasure decides it wants to take it from us and dictate our lives, where does this freedom come from? Should come as no surprise that for Maximus this comes from Christ. He says that Christ despoiled them at the time of his death that he likewise eliminated from our human nature the passion connected with pain. And his love of humanity, he accomplishes this restoration for us as though we were himself liable. And what is more, in his goodness, he reckoned to us the glory what he has restored. Christ has despoiled the power of pleasure that makes us subservient. He has despoiled death, destroying death by his own death. Therefore, it has lost its sting. And it's lost its power that makes you fear that you're going to miss out. The whole fear of missing out idea is a big cause for a lot of ideas of, I need the pleasure, I need to get what I can get when I can get it. But if death is not the end, if it has been despoiled, then indeed you might have reason to say no to a pleasure. That the passions shouldn't have gripped you in this way and you can use them for your end instead of them dominating you. So for Maximus, the passions have a root in something that can be useful. Like Palamas talked about, the direction, the energies you have with that could help you to flourish and live a great and fantastic life. You just have to know how you're using them and what role they have in your life. So 
we spent more time with hesychism than we have with any other system. We could have easily spent an entire semester on any of them so far, but spent a little bit more time on hesychism because the ideas are both familiar and a little more foreign. They're close to what most of us probably kind of thought in one way or another because it shares some of our worldview, but it's also different and it really pushes us and challenges us on how we should see the passions in a different way than what we addressed within Judaism and notions of halacha, let alone with those other systems of beliefs and practices from ancient India or ancient Athens. So what has this religious system told us about what's ethical or what would constitute a good life? What are the passions and how we should overcome them and why we should overcome them? In what ways does succumbing to the passion reduce the meaningfulness of life? What has hesychism told us to help us on this journey? And while many of us might like the religious aspects of it, some of us don't. And what aspects of this can be used and maintained apart from the overtly religious? Which ways can you use it and take from it and learn from it, even if it's not your cup of tea and but yet there's something there. Is this religious system an ethical one? Is it essentially an ethic, not terribly different than cynicism, hedonism, stoicism, but definitely has some notions of religion in it. It's, it's definitely directed towards the good which is personified with the God, and yet it's trying to figure out what it is to be human and where you fit into this larger system. So what qualities of an ethical system does it contain? What qualities do you think it's lacking? And is it more or less an ethical system with a veneer of God on top? And does that change fundamentally what it is? Really, the question for us is, how will this system help you answer the big questions today and how you should live with the struggles that exist all around you? That's fundamentally what we're trying to do here is address these big questions and which ways we can apply them to our own life. So how does this do that for you?